Before I get started with this week's impact review, a reminder, we're now in September now. I laid down the gauntlet, the challenge, that if you guys buy 15 of these Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirts from the OTRS Central Store at Pro Wrestling Tees by the end of this month that we are now in, then I would have no choice but to buy the four-disc Best of Jeff Jarrett DVD set that TNA put out almost a decade ago, watch all four discs, which is a total of 16 hours of slap nuts, mid-fist, mid-card, piece of crap, suck fest, and then come on here and review that. I know you sadistic bastards want to see me do that. I know you want to put me through that. So put your money where your mouth is and go buy the assumed Jeff Jarrett position shirt. And for those of you wondering... How many of these shirts people have bought so far? How many do you fucking think? As the shirt says on the back, 10,000 guitars broken, zero dimes drawn. And the sad thing is because this is a black shirt and two-sided print, I'm really making like no money off of this. This is all about trying to move a little bit of merch and also at the same time, cross a certain threshold with pro wrestling tees to where once you sell a certain number of shirts you can then do more designs and i've got more designs i want to do but we got to sell some shirts so this is a way i thought was mutually beneficial for all so hashtag go buy the fucking shirt you've got this whole month i don't care one person buys 15 but it's ironic it's an assumed jeff jarrett position shirt and you've bought zero of them it seems almost fitting but anyways, on to the other business at hand. Let's talk about Impact this week. One thing I do appreciate about this week's show is that there was very little emphasis on non-roster members, except for one storyline that was aggravating that I will get to at the very end. But not pushing a bunch of AAA crap, not doing this and not doing that. Um, I appreciated that. We start off the show with Eli Drake and Chris Adonis. It's Eli Drake's coronation. It's Eli Drake's first show as the Global Force Wrestling Global Champion. Sweet Jesus, hallelujah, glory, Eli Drake. Somebody that actually looks like a world champion is world champion. Somebody that can actually talk on the microphone is world champion. Imagine that. I'm imminently more interested now, or infinitely more interested now, because Eli Drake, excuse me, Eli Drake is the Global Force Wrestling Global Champion. And even how they had him get interrupted here during his celebration, with first Johnny Impact coming out, Eddie Edwards coming out, you're talking about Eddie Edwards, who was the last one to get eliminated, so obviously he would have a bit of a gripe here, and he would want a shot at Eli Drake's championship. Johnny Impact's the big name that just was brought in, and he made a bit of a splash in the gauntlet for the gold the week before, so he thinks he has a, a right, he has a claim here, because he feels like he's a bigger name than Eddie Edwards, and even Jim Cornette coming out, you know, I will say this with Cornette, um, so far, most of the stuff he's done on TV has been all right. And you set up the tag match, the main event match, where if either one of those two guys pins Eli Drake, they get a future title shot against the champion. And if they don't, he doesn't have to defend him against either one of those guys. I'm like, okay, cool. Effective opening segment. Get in, accomplish a couple different things, set up something for later in the night, and move the hell on. Um, I got to say this about OVE. Versus Bahim Bakara. I think that's how you say their names. It doesn't really matter. Probably not. Um, number one, I was more interested in Fatty Ba's uh, front butt as I was anything else on this show. Like, literally, the dude's front butt is at least as big, if not bigger, than his back butt. That, that That's almost borderline impressive stuff. I mean, really. But OVE... I will say this, they're trying to present them like they matter, because right now they probably do. They're trying to build them up quickly, so that way you have an actual tag team challenger uh, for LAX, which again, I completely understand. So far, I'm not really digging OVE though. I just, I look at them, and they look, I, no, no offense, but they look kind of bushly. They really do. They look like the type of guys you would see 
wrestling as weekend warriors on the independent circuit in front of 100 people. They do not look like guys, do not act like guys, do not present themselves as guys that should be on a national television platform. Maybe eventually they'll get there, but right now they look kind of bushly to me. And to me, these guys don't really do anything for me that makes them stand out or makes them really exciting. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. What did have me excited? Seeing Petey Williams wrestle Caleb Conley on the show and beating Caleb Conley. Fucking Petey Williams is back home, and that's the way I look at it. He's back home. He is where he belongs. He is where we want him. The maple leaf muscle, the Canadian destroyer, all of that. Petey Williams is back, baby. And that reason alone is enough to celebrate. So glory, glory, holla, freaking Luya. Uh, what I won't celebrate, though, is Congo Kong squashing Richard Justice, the standby wrestler. What is so standby about him? What is the point of this gimmick? Why is this guy taking up a roster spot? And then when it comes to Congo Kong, he's not good. I'm sorry. Maybe he could get better, but his, his, his punches look weak. He just looks awkward in his ring movement. It seems like he doesn't really know how to work like a big guy. And everything about him is just really awkward, weird, or not very good. The only thing actually that's semi-impressive about him and kind of in a sag way, sad way is his saggy tits. Why do we need to have Congo Kong squashing somebody to establish him? And the dude that fucking whatever the hell his name is that is coming out and facing off with him that's now filling in the Brodus uh, Clay, the uh, Tyrus, excuse me, role... He's much more impressive to me than a Congo Kong. So if this dude is being utilized in this way to get the Indian dude over, then so be it. But otherwise, I don't see what the point is of all of this. Because again, sorry, no offense, but Congo Kong does nothing for me at this point. He's not very good. What also didn't do much for me on this show was low-key wrestling James Storm, low-key beating James Storm. Like, Dick Storm so pissed about this, he refused to appear on the review this week. Horrible. This match was really kind of random. Just awkwardly kind of thrown together. Why have Lowkey join LAX and not be in the world title picture? That's what I don't really get. And then, you know, you sit there and you have him involved and he's wrestling somebody like a James Storm. I, I, I don't get it. And what's really stupid about all of this when all of a sudden, no, number one is granted, it's okay that Loki beat a James Storm with the amount of help that he got. It's not okay that a Loki beat a James Storm that when we know within a few weeks period of time as the, we catch up on the TV tapings, we know Loki is no longer with the damn company due to creative differences. This is the problem about canning weeks upon weeks of tapings at a time. This would be the type of thing where it would have been nice to know that Loki wasn't going to be there because maybe he wouldn't have it be in a situation where he's going over on a James Storm when you're really not going to get any payoff or return on that in any way, shape, or form. Oh, God. Laurel Van Ness, Joseph Park, and Grado. I know along with Fool Killer, this has been the storyline that has frustrated us and vexed us to no end. And for good reason. But I will take it a little bit easy. No, I won't. I'm not going to take it much easier on this storyline this week because it's still fundamentally stupid in so many different ways. But at least we got some type of acknowledgement of some type of logic and some type of sensibility here. After all this time, we finally just now find out that she's from Canada. And the look on Grado and Joseph Park's face pretty much says it all. Like, oh my God. To which I would ask, why in the fuck didn't you bother looking at her Twitter to see that she was from Canada? Why didn't you fucking ask her if she was an American citizen before you hatched this whole scheme? But at least there is some type of semblance of trying to mirror reality here. And I give them credit. This feels like a massive audible after realizing the gaping plot hole. 
You're not going to tell me that this company is good enough and consistent enough with its storytelling and piecing things together on a week-in, week-out basis that this was planned or intended all along. I call bullshit on that one. But at least they did it. At least it's an attempt to close the logic holes. But ultimately, this story is so fundamentally stupid on so many different levels and to be such a waste of time. Because if this story doesn't end with a Grado heel turn or and or a Grado Joseph Park marriage, then there is no payoff. The whole situation is stupid and pointless. Again, why would anybody like Grado in this situation? He's clearly only marrying somebody because he wants something out of them. In this case, he's not a gold digger. He's a visa digger. Because he thought marrying this girl who clearly had issues, but all of a sudden we're pretending like she has no issues at all. And she just magically figured it out, which I'm pretty sure is exactly not how any of this works when it comes to mental health. We're now sitting there and... <laughs> I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. We're supposed to like the guy who's clearly trying to use a mentally unstable woman to get something that he really wants. And then to make it so bad as this whole plan has been hatched out, instead of going to her from the very beginning and asking for help and saying, here's the situation that we face, and as this has played out on television for literally weeks and going on months now, apparently she doesn't watch the show to realize, hey, there's something going on here. And, and then we come to the whole issue of why couldn't Grado just get a new visa on his own? Why do we need to do any of this bullshit? So a guy that cut tail and run when LVN needed his, her help, his help, a guy that is trying to use and manipulate her to meet his own uh, desired end, a visa digger in this case, we're supposed to like and we're supposed to cheer for How does this make any fucking sense? It's whatever. Moving on. The main event match, because ultimately it wasn't the last thing we ended this show with, because why the hell would it be? Eli Drake and Adonis versus Eddie Edwards, Johnny Impact. At least I'll say this again. You had the guy who was eliminated last and the big name addition from last week's show were here in the main event. Also, the world champion was both in the opening segment of the show and in the main event match of the show. So, you're presenting your world champion away like he matters. And what's cool about this is when you have this type of match, where an Eddie Edwards, a Johnny Impact, if either one of them win and pin Eli Drake, they get a title shot, you usually would see like a WWE, one of those two guys is ultimately going to pin Eli Drake. Because we are going to pin our world champion in non-title matches on a consistent basis. This company did the complete opposite. Even though they had Eli Drake cheat to do it, he still, by hook or by crook, won the match. He got the pinfall. Therefore, he's not going to have to defend against either one of these guys. To which Jim Cornette's response is that, okay, you don't have to defend against either one of these guys, but next week... You have to defend against Matt Seidel, who wants his title shot. So Matt Seidel, after beating Lashley, now realizes, apparently, that the X Division would be beneath him. Why wouldn't you go after the World Championship? And I'm like, oh my god, that makes sense. So even with some of the talent that I kind of question on this show, some of the nonsensical stuff, there were some attempts this week to do some things logically, which I applaud them for. Until you get to the top team bullshit. Here's what I don't understand about all this. If you don't want those guys there, why in the fuck are you letting them in? It's not public property. It's private property. You're running the event. Why wouldn't you have them banned from... Universal Studios, period, let alone just the Impact Zone. And once they even get into the park and show up at the Impact Zone, why would you let them in? Why wouldn't you have police escort them off the premises? And if they refuse and don't comply, then you have them arrested. Hell, tell the cops they're black and they'll beat the piss out of them. Uh, maybe not, because then they would just, they don't even do that anymore. In 25 years, we went from beating black men as, and from the cop standpoint to now they just say, hey, you're black, it's a license to die. Fucked up. But 
as a society for you. But, again, why are we doing this shit where we're making this big deal? You've got the fucking founder. You've got Jim Cornette. They're having all types of conniption fits about America's top team being the there. Then don't let them fucking be there. It's that simple. And it's this illogical, idiotic bullshit that really frustrates me when it comes to professional wrestling. And yes, maybe it shouldn't. And maybe you're absolutely right. But is it too much to ask for basic, simple, solid logic to be at play and be utilized here? And then later on, with Bobby Lashley, you have the sit-down interview. They show a little bit of it with him and Dan Lambert and everybody. Why is Dan Lambert getting more television time, more focus, and more mic time than the vast majority of the actual Impact fucking roster? And why would Bobby Lashley need to make a decision? Has it significantly impacted his abilities as a professional wrestler or his abilities as an MMA fighter to do both of them? No. So again, why in the fuck would it matter? What difference would it fucking make why are we going on this whole premise that he needs to choose one when to me clearly it's not impacting him in either way if he's doing both of them and doing them fine and doing them at a top level why the fuck wouldn't he be able to continue to do so see bo jackson it's just stupid the whole premise of this is fucking dumb the whole fact that dan lambert is getting more promo time more microphone time and more camera time then the majority of the fucking roster, and in particular the freaking knockouts who resorted to having a couple of backstage segments where, of course, we had to weasel in the fucking horse-faced bitch of a wife again this week. There is something fundamentally wrong here. And then again, the last thing on this show is dealing with this America Top Team bullshit. Why in the fuck are we making such a big deal out of this? Where in the hell is the payoff? What is this building towards? Are we building towards the fucking founder versus Dan Lambert at Bound for Glory? Are we building up some big old five on five fucking match between America's top team and the fucking M- the GFW roster at Bound for Glory? What the fuck is this all about? The whole thing that confused me too, when Cornette's addressing Lashley and talking about this and talking about they wouldn't be on Triple Mania. Didn't Triple Mania already happen? Why would we implement that and utilize that in a television promo after the Triple Mania event has actually already happened. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I could be mistaken, but I swear to God, Triple Mania just happened, didn't it? Isn't that where Sexy Star did something to Rosemary's arm? It looks kind of bad. It looks kind of bush league and amateur to reference something after it's already happened. And saying, I'm not going to allow you to do it. It's just dumb. And again, I could be mistaken. If I am, I'm sure you're going to let me know. And that's fine, too. <laughs> but... But what's, what's the payoff here? Are you building towards Bobby Lashley and King Mo at Bound for Glory? Again with the King Mo crap? Who gives a shit? Are you building towards Bobby Lashley versus the fucking founder of Bound for Glory? Is that where we really need to go with Lashley at this point in time? We're giving all of this television time to a bunch of MMA guys that in large part these wrestling fans that are bless their hearts, willing to stick through two hours of Impact Wrestling every week, don't give a shit about. They really don't. And this is the problem with professional wrestling now. So many of the people in wrestling are such fucking marks for MMA that they try to incorporate MMA in to professional wrestling and thinking that's the way to go, and it's the exact fucking opposite. Because MMA is not going to let professional wrestling into the same level. And let's face it, if MMA was so fucking hot and so fucking popular, they wouldn't have to come in the UFC's case and get a Brock Lesnar every once in a while to main event a pay-per-view because they haven't been able to build enough stars. And the biggest star that they have now just fought a basically a glorified exhibition against Floyd Money Mayweather, a mat, a fight that did millions of more pay-per-view buys than anything UFC is ever going to fucking put out. And boxing is dead as a doorknob in general as a sport, but still could occasionally give you that big freaking money fight, especially with Money Mayweather. And that's crazy because a lot of people know that Money Mayweather fights are going to go two ways. Number one, 
Mayweather is going to win. And number two, he fights a defensive, boring style to watch. It's that simple. But people still know that, and they will still fork over big money to watch him fight. MMA could only dream of getting that type of pay-per-view buy rate for any type of fight that they could put out there. And the fact that people like Jeff Jarrett and everybody involved, Global Force Wrestling, thinks that this shit is a good idea is just frustrating as hell to me. You only have two hours of primetime television each week on a network where you do an ad revenue split and don't make a ton of money off of the deal anyways. And in this case, this week's show didn't even crack the top 150 of cable shows on Thursday night. That's not good. So why not utilize every possible moment of that two hours that you have to try and get as many people on your roster over as much as you possibly can? Stop bringing in all these people from fucking AAA and putting over another promotion. And most importantly, stop putting over MMA and fucking professional wrestling when there is no real point to it and there is no fucking payoff. And all we do is make the company, the product, the writing, the booking look fucking stupid. And what's so frustrating about this is you know this top team bullshit is probably going all the way through Bound for Glory. That means another two months potentially of this crap. And I don't know if that's true because I haven't read the spoilers. I'm not going to read the spoilers. We are looking at potentially another two months of this. Why? For what fucking reason? It's just dumb. It's like Impact as a show, GFW as a brand. It's the old things of can't get out of their own fucking way. Some things are just so fundamentally stupid that they insult the fans' intelligence. And then you get shit like this that is pointless and it really does nothing to help the goddamn company. If it's not going to help you, then why are you fucking doing it? Anyways, that's what I thought about this week's Impact Wrestling Show. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. And remember, here at OTRS Central, we're doing everything we can to make wrestling fun again. Buy the goddamn damn assume Jeff Jarrett positioned shirt because like the shirt says 10,000 guitars broken zero dimes drawn which carries over to Jeff Jarrett and unfortunately carries over to the shirt sales for this freaking t-shirt and remember OTRS Central is not the wrestling show you want just the wrestling show you need and for some of you that don't watch Impact Wrestling but watch the review remember most importantly in your case I watch this shit so you don't have to